Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marcus De Silva, and we are reconvening for part two. Uh, turned into an accidental uh, part two episode, but I'm very happy that it did. Gives us uh, more time to really get into the details on some incredible stories from this book entitled We Saved Sog Souls by Roger Lockshear. And pleasure to be speaking with Roger yet again. And we're going to be starting off with uh, a, a mission that I guess has a lot of folklore attached to it amongst the SOG guys. And so it's uh, when you read this, when you read the two chapters um, that this mission is a part of, it's ridiculous. It's so hard to believe uh, that anybody made it out alive on that mission. Um, but it's incredible. We're going to get into it. So I'm just going to start off by just reading uh, just a quick introduction to the mission, and then we'll hand it over to Roger and we'll go from there. So this is uh, starting at chapter 19. While we were at Mylock, Major Sincere informed us that we were going to insert a team into an area where we had failed to do so on two previous attempts. The first time we tried in mid-August, we received heavy NVA fire at both the Chosen and Secondary LZs. The same held true the second time we tried to insert the team again a few weeks later. The LZs were located in a northwestern area of Laos. At that extreme distance, our helicopters were able to reach the target, spend a few minutes on station, and then still have enough fuel to return safely to at least Vandegrift FSB to refuel. The team that was chosen for this mission was not a regular named team. It was a team that had been specifically put together for this mission by Staff Sergeant Tim Schaff, who would be the 1-0. In addition to Schaff, the team was comprised of Sergeant John Smitty Smith as 1-2 and First Lieutenant Mike Armstrong as 1-3, as well as five Brew mercenaries. On the afternoon of September 22nd, 1968, Covey writer Pat Watkins radioed into Mylock Talk that the LZ selected for the insertion was clear of visible NVA, the weather over the LZ was clear, and the mission was going to be a go. We loaded up the team on Huey Slicks from our sister company of the 101st Airborne Aviation Battalion and headed for Vandegrift FSB, where we topped off our fuel tanks for the long trip out to the LZ. We lifted off and headed toward Quezon, then on toward Korok Mountain and into Laos. As soon as we passed the stronghold of Korok Mountain on the Laotian border, things started getting interesting. Just like every other time, we entered the enemy's backyard. And so we'll hand it over to you where I guess the, the AAA fire and the fun begins. Right. And uh, this, this was becoming a, somewhat of a norm when we were going into uh, into Laos, especially up in, in that particular area. Uh, so as we were heading out to the uh, selected LZ, um, yeah, we were receiving some uh, considerable amount of anti-aircraft fire. And if you can imagine uh, photos of World War II bombers going into Germany and you see all these air bursts going on, that's what was happening. Uh, we were being shot at with uh, with cannons, uh, exploding air bursts uh, all around, all around. So we, you know, we kept changing altitude slightly to try to keep the confusion. Um, and for some reason, the uh, the anti aircraft wasn't was unable to uh, zero in on us, which was a good thing. Uh, about halfway out there. Um, we were we were going above an area where there was some low cloud level, uh, cloud almost ground fog down below us, and I happened to look down, and in the clouds below us, uh, the sun was if you can envision us moving forward, the sun to our right and above, and casting a shadow of our helicopter down onto the the fog or ground cover, the low uh, fog. And mysteriously, strangely enough, it cast a shadow of our helicopter surrounded in a, cir in a circle of like reddish, rainbowish color. 
it looked exactly like a target with the helicopter in the center. And uh, as I'm looking at it, now I'm thinking this is not a this is not a good omen. So I I I called my partner Scott. I said, "You got to you know you got to look at you got to see this." So he you know he leaned slid over and, and looked out, and I said, "This is not a good sign." And he, he said, "No, this is not going to be a good day." So uh, with that with that premonition and omen or whatever you want to call it, we we continued on. Uh, the any aircraft uh, started to let up uh, the closer we got to our site. Um, we brought in our um, our team. Uh, excuse me, I, I got ahead of myself. Th th that was that was when we were um, saying when we went in to get the team, and which is correct on the on the twenty eighth is when we finally got in. Um, we tried several times before we were we were sent sent back because of um, cloud banks, bad weather. We could not penetrate Laos for several days, which was very, very frustrating. And our, our team was down there uh, by themselves, trying to get, wanting to get a, taken out. So anyway, um, on the 28th, when we finally penetrated the area, um, as we got closer to the uh, our destination, the inner aircraft fire let up and was quiet for just a few moments. And then um, as we made a wide circle, we, we kind of headed, in a westerly, uh, I mean, a southerly direction, heading a circular to the west and then north, we started picking up some heavy machine gun fire from a distant mountain mountain range, and I think we were out of pretty much out of range, but it was the same uh, machine gun fire that we encountered um, when we brought the team in, which was which was kind of interesting, but. Um, so as we started to approach the region where the team was making its way for extraction, um, we saw what was dozens and dozens of North Vietnamese regulars on full uh, run heading in the direction to where the LZ was located. Now, they weren't real close to the LZ at this point. But they were clearly, clearly headed in that direction, and dozens of them. I, I couldn't even tell you how many. Um, I took the opportunity to open fire and um, take down whatever I could. And um, the well-disciplined soldiers didn't even return the fire. Uh, they were they were on they were on a um, they were on a, a mission. And um, this didn't disrupt them, which was very strange. As we got close to the uh, closer to the uh, LZ to the pickup point, our team was uh, getting in very, very serious situation. They had been um, surrounded at the LZ by North Vietnamese, um, which turned out to be literally hundreds. Um, and we're talking a team of three Americans and five brew, a small team of eight that have been on the ground uh, for uh, seven days now. They should have only been there two or three. They were exhausted um, and they were about to be annihilated. Now the uh, North Vietnamese, as they had grown to do, of recent times, held off wiping out the team, um, deliberately, uh, in our opinion, our minds was so that they can knock down some helicopters first. The team wasn't going anywhere and they could have overrun the team at any moment uh, with a vastly superior, you know, manpower and weaponry and whatnot. So, um, Pat Watkins, who was uh, the Covey rider, um, was directing us in, and um, we were going to set up a, um, a a trolling run to, on the LZ to see exactly how much uh, the enemy was a little more concealed there 
than they were in the open area where I had previously seen them. Uh, they were a little better concealed. We made a, a gun run past the LZ um, fairly slow, what we call trolling, to try to draw fire, uh, to see what, what we were up against and to see, you know, um, how well it will be to extract the team for the slick. Uh, we drew a lot of fire. Uh, we took a bunch of hits. Um, so we made uh, made a swing around. We picked up the um, the slick. Uh, and as we were approaching the LZ, uh, gunfire erupted again. And at the very last moment, the um, slick pilot who uh, was new to this type of mission just before he was no more than 15 feet off the ground, off the team. And under the heavy gunfire, he panicked and pulled pitch and pulled out of the LZ without the team. Um, and we made it, we, we unloaded a bunch of weaponry on the NVA. Uh, took some more hits um, and circled back to regroup. Um, on the radio communication, our our pilot called the um, the slick and asked him what the hell just happened. And the pilot said, "I can't go in. I'm going to get shot down." He said, "I, I can't go in." Uh, Tim Schaff monitoring the communication. On the, Tim Schaff on the ground, over the radio said loud and clear, "If you don't get us out now, we're never coming out." And and that was true. I mean, it was there's no way. Um, and our pilot Jim Whitman uh, answered the uh, slick pilot, the UE slick pilot, "If you don't go in and get that team right now, um, I'm going to shoot you down myself." And I do believe he was dead serious. I mean, we we had a commitment to that team. There, there was only one way that those men were going to survive, and we had to get them out. So our pilot said, listen, we're going to go in. We're going to guide you in. We're going to go in very low speed. We're going to pace alongside of you. We're going to put ourselves between you and all this heavy gunfire. And um, he said, we'll guide you right to the LZ so you can pick up the team. And you're going to do that. So he reluctantly said, OK. Um, we set up our approach. As we were coming into the LZ, we were taking an ungodly amount of gunfire. Um, I was out in the skids. Um, just shooting nonstop as we normally did. My partner, Scott, was on, on the other side doing the same thing. We were firing, firing off volley and volley and volley of rockets. Um, and our um, our 40 millimeter cannon uh, co-pilot was firing that thing just nonstop. And that's uh, those are exploding grenades type. Um, they're the same as an M79 grenade launcher, but these are belted. And and uh, so we took heavy hits. At, at one point, um, I, I felt my head snap back, and um, I didn't think any anything of it. I mean, there was just so much going on at the time. Uh, as I was firing on the uh, on the NVA, uh, it, it it felt like everything was moving in slow motion. It was just, I mean, my M60 couldn't fire up fast enough, couldn't cycle fast enough. It seemed like, I mean, for every, every, you know, every round I was putting out, it seemed like 10 were coming at us. And um, then uh, a short distance from the LZ, we uh, felt like we hit a speed bump. Um, didn't think any, anything more of it at the moment. Um, continued on to get the team. Um, I could see Tim Schaff literally tossing the little people up on the, into the, uh, into the slick. Um, and they were, uh, Mike Armstrong and, um, Smitty, John Smith, 
were firing their their car 15s nonstop nonstop while they're being picked up and when they're getting into the, the helicopter um the nva were right there they were right right there within feet and um scott and i were able to put our machine gun fire um right on right on the edge of the lz right onto the the charging nva um and kept, you know, helped keep them from, uh, you know, breaching the, the, the little perimeter and whatnot. As we came out of the LZ, um, we continued to get hits. I could feel our our uh, our, our gunship was shaking. I could feel um, high high vi um, high frequency vibrations in my feet, which meant that the tail rotor had been damaged. I could feel low frequency in my in my core, my body core, which was an indication that the main rotor had been damaged. Um, I could smell fuel. I could smell uh, hydraulic fluid, um, and I can I could see red lights on the dashboard, on the control panels, all over flashing. Um, as we came out of the LZ, um, the slick pilot. Called, called a mayday. Um, he'd been he had been hit. The the chopper had been hit severely. Uh, we had been hit severely. Uh, he was going to crash. Uh, we we stayed with him to continue to um, try to suppress anything that was getting near near them and coming up at them. Um, we guided them to an area uh, where they crash landed. Um, in the meantime, Covey, um, Pat Watkins called us and said, uh, our, our call sign on this mission was hair, like rabbit hair. Um, he said, uh, hair lead, hair lead, you are on fire. So with that, you know, I leaned out of the helicopter and look back and and sure enough we're on fire there's flames just coming out of the exhaust uh of the uh of the turbine engine and the engine compartment um we're losing power uh, i could feel it i could see it i can hear i can hear that the the uh rotor rotation is decreasing and as i, I glanced in uh to the the uh pilots the the cockpit i could see um, our pilot struggling to keep the engine RPM and the rotor RPM matched. I mean, that's the key, that's the key to staying afloat. Um, we lo we're looking for a place to land, to crash, and uh, we spotted in the distance a large clearing, and in that clearing. There were four longhouses. Longhouses are uh, like NBA billeting and headquarters and such things like that. A major, major, like divisional type headquarters area. Um, so what we did, we just unloaded everything we had. Um, I, 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 Scott and I went back out in the skids firing our M60s into these buildings, into the distance. Uh, we unloaded the rest of our rockets and as much of the 40 millimeter cannon fire into these longhouses and NVA were coming out of there like you stirred up an anthill. Uh, they were coming out and they were dropping as fast as they were coming out. We, we were um, focused on them, heavily focused on them. And they were paying a dear, dear price. Um, we were trying to do as much damage to them as possible because where our Huey Slick went down was only about 300 yards at most from that clearing uh, of where the, all these NBA were coming out of. Um, so we managed to do that. We certainly slowed them down. We exploded those buildings. Um, and then we crashed. We crashed through a uh, a bamboo stand that um, helped cushion our crash somewhat. 
but it was it was nonetheless it was a hard crash uh i was knocked out um my partner scott got thrown uh outside the aircrafts uh, he he tightened up his monkey strap his seat belt um to keep him you know from going far but he's nonetheless he he got a, a nasty body snap um as you can you can imagine uh whiplash of a body of the body uh so to speak um i got slammed against the back of our uh co-pilot seat and um just before that before we before we crashed i tried to talk to scott to see if he was okay um our communications was all knocked out. It was the controls were the uh, avionics for that for the intercom was shot up, so we couldn't talk. <clears throat> and I I mouthed to him, "Are you okay?" And and he's saying yes, and he's pointing like this, you know, to my helmet. And you know, I went and he goes, so I put my hand up, and that's when I felt this huge gash uh, on the side of my helmet where a bullet struck uh, the ballistic helmet, did its job. It kept the bullet from penetrating. And that's when apparently when my head snapped back during uh, during the fight. Um, so we crashed. We're on the ground. Um, we can hear the NBA yelling um, orders, whatever, moving in our direction. Our sister ship our sister our wing ship gunship made one pass it followed us till we crashed trying to protect us uh it made one pass on the um charging nva and had to leave and um they were running out of fuel they, i mean they just they couldn't stay any longer um what we didn't know at the time was that um the slick with the team um was able to be picked up by one of the chase helicopters um we had um uh, two additional two extra chase helicopters on this mission um one of them was able to pick up the team plus the entire crew of the uh of the slick none of which were injured uh no injuries whatsoever uh there was uh, one chase ship left, and it turns out I didn't find this out until uh, years and years later that he was a greenhorn. It was like his first SOG mission, and he was way up in the air around seven thousand feet, circling, eating a banana or something, and, and not expected to get into anything. And all of a sudden, now he's um, he's coming in to rescue us, and he's being shot at. Um, he's being shot at. I, we, I could hear the um, the 12.7 millimeter heavy machine gun. It's it's equivalent to a 50 caliber. Um, and this thing is just boom, 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 boom. And I could see tracers going by, the green tracers overhead. Um, I could we could hear people coming through the jungle. Um, we went into our standard operating procedure in uh, such an event that we had practiced and rehearsed. And that was that upon the crash, Scott would go to the side compartment. It was a small compartment on, this, on the right side of the helicopter that held a survival kit. Uh, he was to grab that inside the survival kit. There were basic uh, survival um, components. There, there was a um, uh, like a hatchet, a, a woodsman is what it actually was. A, if you know what a wood, a woodsman machete or a woodsman hatchet is, it was one of those. There were some aspirin, band aids, different first aid kit, first aid things, and unusual, uh, which we always thought was kind of odd. There was a condom in there, and it was <laughs> the condom was meant to use as a water container to actually contain water, um, and obviously in a small compact. Um, container. So he got that. My my job was to uh, reach in from the co-pilot side, uh, zero, out, zero out all the radios to the zero frequency position, go around to the front. After that, 
um, our pilot was to grab any maps, any papers, any documents at all. He was to grab those, which he already had. I went around the front, opened up the avionics um, panel and proceeded to shoot up all the avionics, all the radios, all the equipment in the front with the M60. I mean, that's what our our, our operating procedure was. And this was done amongst, our, amongst ourselves that we developed. So after doing that, um, we could hear advancing NVA. Scott and I um, were using our M60s, uh, firing in a direction we could hear, hear them coming. Um, as we were firing, uh, we could hear the results of our um, our shooting. We could hear uh, soldiers um, crying out and whatnot. Um, then, uh, as the helicopter hovered above us, uh, the um, there was a medic on board, an SF medic. Um, Staff Sergeant Crawford, Dick Crawford, the fat quack, as he was affectionately known. He decided that he was going to come on the ground to uh, to help us that were in need of medical help. He didn't realize that we really didn't need any, but he didn't know. He, he operated on instinct and he jumped out. Now, he jumped out. It, it had to be 15, 20 feet above i mean the, the the slick was hovering above our crashed helicopter he jumped out um he, he's on the ground with us now um our helicopter as i looked at our helicopter i mean the ground all around us was wet from um jp4 fuel leaking out of the uh, tanks um the engine was smoldering it, it, to me i mean i could smell the hydraulic fluid could smell the JP-4, and here's this engine smoldering. And to me, it looked like a bomb getting ready to just explode. Um, it was flat. The skids were wrapped up. It was sitting, the helicopter was sitting right on its belly. Uh, it was shot up. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. It was, there were so many bullet holes in there. There, there had to be hundreds um I looked in looked in to where I was sitting and Scott was sitting that whole area was covered with bullet holes there were bullet holes coming through the floor there were bullet holes in the in the uh cargo the back um the, where we would you know we would have been sitting or um where we were occupying and there didn't seem to be more than a, a foot apart of any of them didn't seem to be more than so and I was wondering how the hell did how did that happen? I mean, how come how come I'm not full of holes? Um, it, it just didn't seem possible. The the um, rotor blade was shredded. The main rotor was shredded. The tail rotor was shredded. Uh, the tail boom was all shredded. Um, I don't know um, at the time. I didn't, couldn't figure out why we didn't explode on impact, which is usually the case. Um, especially with leaking fuel cells and, and whatnot, and the engine on fire. Um, later, I determined, just you know, guessing, my guess, is that one of the um, damages uh, must have happened to the fuel control unit, which is on, on my side, the left side of the helicopter, the left side of the engine. And what it is is basically uh, like a fuel injection unit, and it's the main controller of the fuel. And if that got knocked out, then perhaps it stopped pumping fuel, period. Um, and and I, I that's the only explanation I could have for uh, fuel not exploding, for it not exploding like that. But anyway, um, we're on the ground. We're fighting off the uh, encroaching NBA. And the slick up above us, the crew chief and door gunner, um, tossed down four McGuire, four McGuire rigs. Um, we were going to have to go out on ropes. These McGuire rigs were the very, very primitive type McGuire rig. Uh, it just had a sewn in like saddle type seat where you can slip your legs in. You had to hold on to the rope. Uh, there was no rips, uh, wrist strap like they, they came out just weeks later. Um, so you had to hold on or you're going to invert and fall out. So now we had four ropes, four McGuire rigs and five people. 
So um, after after uh, Crawford helped uh, Mr. Whitman and Mr. Chapman get into their McGuire rigs, uh, they had never used them before. Scott and I had practiced with these. We knew how to put them on, but but still Scott put his on backwards. But um, And then we were ready to be lifted up. Uh, Crawford attached himself to me, uh, to my McGuire rig. And um, I had Scott left his M60 behind. His weapon of choice, personal weapon, was his M79 grenade launcher. Um, I had my M60, and I had a, a length of belted ammo on the gun, in the gun, loaded. As we started lifting out of the uh, bamboo, um, the pilot had to lift us at least 125 feet straight up. Anything less, he would have dragged us through the trees. It, would, it could have dragged us through our, our rotor, our mast, if he didn't go straight up. And... At the same time, he was being fired on by this 12.7 millimeter machine gun. Uh, he kept his cool. He went straight up. Uh, when we got about 50 to 75 feet off the ground, the NBA charged into the clearing underneath us with their AKs on full blast. They're just blasting and shooting straight up. And they're, they're right below us. I mean, you can almost reach out and touch them. Um, I let go a burst of the M60 and, and dropped two of them. Scott uh, fired off around the M79 that exploded. Um, my M60 jammed after about you know six rounds or so because I was holding it almost you know vertically up and down, so it, it jammed. Um, so I let go of it. It dropped down uh, and went through the overhead window canopy window of the uh, helicopter on the on the co-pilot side and um it just bought us enough time to uh to clear the clearing and um start our journey back our long long journey back it was going to take 45 minutes to an hour to get back now um what we didn't know and weren't thinking of at the time was that everybody was running out of fuel. Everybody had left. Our rescue helicopter, as it was hovering over us, unbeknownst to us, his low fuel warning light came on. And what that means is you have 20 minutes of fuel left under normal conditions, not considering all the drag that five men hanging below the helicopter creates um 20 minutes of fuel his alarms went off but off we went um as we started gaining gaining altitude um i was hurting really really bad um my head my head was pounding um my back my my whole core body was just Hurting. I was just in a lot of pain. Uh, my legs, my hips were were hurting real bad. Um, and apparently it was adrenaline kind of seeping back into the body. Um, so we're in, we're climbing up, we're getting shot at. It was relentless. The, the NVA had great communications through that area from one unit to another. And we're just getting shot at nonstop with heavy weapons, small arms. As we gained altitude, um, now we're getting fired at by the heavy machine guns and the airing aircraft. And we're once again in airburst are being fired around us. Uh, at this, this point, it's about 15 minutes into the lift. Um, my left arm went totally numb and dropped dropped to my side and I couldn't move it. I, I couldn't feel anything. And then I realized that I couldn't feel anything in my legs. Um, my body was hurting like crazy. My head was pounding. And I thought that um, I must have gotten shot, must have gotten a spinal, a spinal 
injury um, and didn't realize. So I was, I was looking around, see if I could see any blood. I didn't see any. I'm looking at Crawford, who was slightly below me, to see if I had any blood running on him. And there was nothing. So I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, I thought maybe a piece of shrapnel may have caught my back. Um, and I have to hang on. Got a long, long, long way to go. So um, as we're moving along, we're only traveling at a, a forward speed of around 50 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour. The, the chopper just couldn't go any faster. I mean, it was there was too much drag. There was altitude involved. Um, it just wasn't meant to do that kind of work. Um, all of a sudden, uh, my my right arm and my right hand started cramping up real bad. Um, I couldn't let go to shake it out. Um, we're getting, we're continuing to get shot. I, these tracers are coming past us. Um, these, these air bursts are all around us. And I'm thinking, how is it that they're not hitting the helicopter? I mean, it's, the, these same air, these same anti-aircraft weapons were regularly shooting down fast movers, jets, fighter jets. They were shooting down the A1Es, the Sky Raiders. They were shooting down other helicopters, Jolly Green Giants. They were shooting them down. How come? What's you know? What's happening? And um, so, at some point in my probably my darkest moment, um, when I didn't think I could hold on any longer, I knew if I let go, Crawford's going with me. We're both going. We're you know, eight thousand feet up in the air and um, I closed my eyes and I said a short prayer and I, I, I said um, to the effect of my God if you so choose if your desire that I live through this day I'll never ever doubt your existence no sooner than I than I said that than I felt I mean, it was like someone put a heated blanket over me. I felt this this warmth come over my body, um, and and I was kind of like awestruck, not not understanding what's happening here. But my head wasn't pounding, my body wasn't hurting, and I I just I just felt comfortable. You know, I wasn't cold anymore. I mean, it gets really cold at 8,000 feet off the ground, 9,000 feet. It gets really cold. And the wind, you know, you got the wind blowing. I didn't feel any of that. I was just, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I was um, tranquil. I was just along for the ride. Now, as I'm looking around and I'm looking at the airbursts, and it's just like, wow, you know, look at that. And there was no fear. In, there was none of that. None of that. Um, Prior, just prior to that, I was thinking that when I didn't think I could hold on any longer, I was thinking that my parents are never going to uh, get my remains. They'll never have closure. What's the what's the government going to tell them? They're not going to tell them that I was on a top secret mission in Laos. What's my girlfriend, my fiance? What is she going to think? What are they going to tell her? You know. There's so many, you know, my body, I, I'm thinking that my body is going to rot here in the jungle and never be recovered. Um, then after after that prayer, I thought, I was thinking, wow, this is going to be okay. But the, the airbursts were still continuing. And these big 14.7 and 12.7 uh, machine gun, heavy machine gun, it's still coming. I mean, they're coming so close, you could you can feel like I could touch them. Uh, one of them came so close, it hit, it it went across uh, Jim Whitman's forehead and cut and cauterized at the same time. Um, when it, but that was it. I mean, he wasn't even bleeding. That's I mean, that's how close these things were coming, but they weren't hitting the helicopter. They didn't hit the ropes that we were on. 
Uh, so we we continued our ride, the rest of my ride back to um, back to uh, uh, homeland or in, back to Vietnam. It was just it was just a ride. I was just along for the ride. I didn't feel any pain. I didn't feel any fatigue. I wasn't cold. Um, I wasn't concerned. Um, when we got back, uh, once we crossed the border by Korak, uh, Korak Mountain, obviously the anti-aircraft stopped and uh, we're home free. So um, we had to go about 10 miles, I guess it is. And we stopped at, landed at the um, first Marine outpost, the first friendly outpost uh, of the north, the northern region. The, this Marine outpost was the furthest of any American uh, soldiers uh, in that part of Vietnam, it's for, right up near the near the DMZ, it's just outside of Quezon. When uh, when the pilot was bringing us in, he misjudged the the height above the ground, and um, kind of dragged us through the concertina wire. Uh, not really us, but Crawford. And again, Crawford, he didn't he didn't get hurt. I mean, his his fatigues, his jungle fatigues got, got shredded, got cut. He got some scratches, but that was it. I mean, he could have been sliced to ribbons, and that was it. Uh, when, the, um, when the slick set us down, um, as soon as he set us down and he moved to set down, his engine went out, and, and he put it down with no engine power. He just set it down. And um, another miracle, you know. So um, from there, uh, I went to I went to get up. Crawford was next to me. He asked me, you know, am I okay? And I you know, I went to get up. I said, I can't, I can't move. I said, but go check on, go, go check Scott, see if Scott's okay and, and the crew, which he did. Um, I tried to get up. I couldn't get up. This this left side was was numb from the waist down. I had no feeling whatsoever. My right foot, the side of the outside of my right foot was laying flat against the ground. I mean, it was like it was disconnected or something. Um, and I thought, I thought, oh shit, I'm paralyzed. And then I, I no sooner said that, and then I thought, you are grateful. You know, you're alive. You know, you're still alive. And uh, so they loaded us up on another slick, uh, brought us to Mylock, uh, checked me out. Uh, Crawford checked me out on the ground while we were there. And and he's, he said, Chief, he said, uh, you must have a spinal injury. He said, you haven't been shot. Uh, so... Um, we went to Mylock, and um, he and another medic um, continued to check me out to see if they could see what was going on. Check Scott out. Scott had some back injuries himself, but he wasn't paralyzed. So from there, uh, we went down to, um, they flew us down to uh, Surgical Hospital, 22nd Surgical Hospital. Battalion Surgical Hospital in Fubai. Crawford stayed with me. I was loaded onto uh, with on a stretcher um, onto another slick. Scott was put on the slick as well. Uh, we went down to uh, Fubai. On the way down, I started I, to go into shock. Apparently, um, the sound of the rotor blades um, was feeling to me, you know how they bang, no, wop, pop, 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 pop. It was, it was starting to affect me like the cannon fire that I was, I was hearing. And for the first time since I'd been in combat, I couldn't see what's going on. I was always, you know, able to see my surroundings, know what's going on. And, and that was affecting me. So uh, Crawford picked up on it. Um, I was probably getting white. <laughs> Probably, and he said, hey, chief, and he's patting me on the chest. 
and he said, no, "You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay." So I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm not leaving. I'm with you. You'll be okay. And it kind of that, that settled me out, and and I I come back to uh, reality or whatever. So we're down at the uh, the twenty second surgical hospital, and um, because we weren't bleeding out, the um, hospital crew was going to, uh, I guess by their standard procedure, go through the normal incoming patient thing, like your name, you know, that's fine, my rank and whatnot. And um, what unit was I from and taught the 101st Airborne and whatnot. That's okay. Cause we didn't have any, we don't have any, any insignias on or anything. We are like not sterile uniforms, but there no rank, no name um no patch so uh then the fun begins uh where did this take place uh crawford who's by my side so that's denied information and this poor clerk i mean he's trying to do his job and he said i'm sorry um but i have to now crawford doesn't have any rank on no name no rank um he could be a general they they didn't know or a private they didn't know um uh, so this dance is going on. I have to know. Oh, you can't. This is denied information. Well, what were what mission were you on? Where did the mission take place? No, that's denied information. Um, going on and on, and then he's saying that I can't, I can't um, admit until we fill out these papers. Um, how did the how did the um, incident happened how did the injuries happen in a crash where was the crash now that's denied information <laughs> so this is going round and round and uh the clerk said i'm gonna have to get my uh, co so he got up went and got the commander who was a uh a colonel a lieutenant colonel and he came back not as a doctor but as a, an administrator and He's saying, um, look, soldiers, he doesn't know anybody's rank. This is formalities we have to do, and uh, we need to know. I'm going to ask some basic questions. And, you know, so again, Crawford saying, no, that's denied information and denied information. And finally, now Crawford, for those who know Crawford, to say it kindly, um, he's a bull in a china shop. He's not the kind of man you want to, to negotiate for you because he has uh, he has two levels, calm and out of control. So um, Crawford stands up and he puts his hands on his hips. Now, he's, he's a pretty good sized guy. When I, I said in the book he was 175 pounds, I don't think he was 175 pounds since he left seventh grade. Uh, he's a big man. Uh, I was being kind. Anyway, um, he, he stands up and he puts his hands on his hips and he looks at this uh, colonel and he said, Colonel, do you know who I am? And he said, no, I don't. And he said, well, my name is Major Clyde Sincere and these are my men. We're from Mylock Special Forces Camp and you will treat my men. And um, he said, well, I have to have more information. And they start to go out. Well, in comes walking Major Sincere. He wanted to see how Scott and I were doing. So he flew down from Mylock. So Major, comes, Major Sincere comes walking in, and Crawford looks at him, and I see this panicked look on his face. And he said to him, he said, uh, Crawford said to him, he said, uh, sir, we need to step outside for a minute. So as Clyde um, explained to me, and Crawford explained to me years later. They went outside. Crawford uh, told him that he told the uh, the commander that he was Major Sincere. And Clyde said, Crawford, do you know the seriousness of impersonating an officer? And he said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, I'm going to deal with you later. <laughs> so... Major Sincere comes in, comes walking up to me, and he, you know, he puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says to this uh, commander, he said, Lieutenant Colonel, do you know who I am? 
And he says, my name is Colonel Roy Barr. I'm commander of all special forces units north of Da Nang. He said, if you don't take care of my men, these are my men, you don't take care of my men right now, I'm going to call, make a call to i headquarters and talk to General so-and-so and see if he can help us out. Now, understand, Colonel Barr was well known in the military high-ranking arena. He was um, a very good friend of, um, of the highest of, of generals. He was um, a close friend of uh, General Westmoreland. Uh, so uh, when he said something, even though he may not have the rank of general, people listen. So the, <laughs> this, this Lieutenant Colonel said, yes, sir, yes, sir, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of these men right away. It's not a problem. So then we were then we were taken care of. Uh, I was X-rayed, found out uh, they realized that um, they couldn't find anything. And um, and the doctor, the doctors that treated us, Scott and I were really good. They were really good. The attendants, the orderlies and whatnot, they were really good. Um, this commander was not. He was he was a, a piece of work. He came to me the next morning and uh he, he said, you know, how are you doing? And I said, okay. And he said, well, I've seen to it that you and your and your buddy are not going to get an, a Purple Heart out of this station. So I said, okay. You know, <laughs> I I really didn't care. And I, I looked at Scott and I said, look, this asshole. <laughs> so anyway, um, the paralysis um, started to go away. First, it was my arm, and my arm started to hurt. It started to hurt, and that was a good sign. Um, and then uh, later that that day uh, that it was there, um, this is the second this the the day after we were admitted. Later that day, the feeling started coming back in my legs. They were severely hurting. Oh, they were hurting so bad. Um, but I was glad I could you know I had the pain. The doctor told me that uh, apparently. Uh, they couldn't prove it, but what the symptomatic uh, symptoms were that I had a, a bruised spinal cord, uh, and that's what, what the paralysis was. And when swelling and all that stuff went down, um, re regained the uh, the use. I was on I was on crutches for a few days, but um, but that was it. That was it. So it was a very um, amazing amazing uh, couple of days. Yeah, I, there, there's so much going on in, in that. I mean, it's it's shocking. And there's so many instances, uh, like, obviously, having read the book, and then listening to you um, tell that story, and I just kind of in my head thinking, you know, like, even when you you are getting lifted up on the wires, and the, they're literally shooting up, they're right there shooting and they're right there, right up. How do they not hit anyone? I don't know. You know, it's, it's, and then you make it back. And I guess that uh, concertina wire, is it just like a barbed wire of sorts? Yeah, concertina. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Concertina wire, um, instead of barbed wire, it's coiled. It's, co it's, it comes in big coils, but it has razor blades essentially. Uh, instead of wire, instead of, you know, like barbed wire, it's it's basically like razor blades all along, all along it, all along the coils. It's razor blades um, and they are razor sharp. Uh, and that's concertina wire. Yeah. So the, the fact that um, that I didn't get pulled through it, um, the fact that Crawford did get pulled through it, but come out of it unscathed. It's just you know it, it's it's hard it's hard to understand. Um, yeah, so so many miracles. The um, I, I give you a little bit of update. A couple of years ago, I I was contacted by the fella who was flying that helicopter that got us out, um, and he said that he had wondered uh, all, all these years um what happened to the, the people he pulled out and he wanted to apologize he said he felt guilt for over four, all these years um for 
setting us down so hard that that one of us he broke their that he thought he broke my legs he, he said he he's felt that guilt all the i said broke my legs no you didn't break my legs you saved my life for one thing but no you didn't you didn't set us down and he in his mind when he saw me that i couldn't i couldn't get up he thought that he did that to me uh and and he explained how he couldn't understand how his low fuel warning came on the light the warning system came on um and by you know all means it should not have I and mean, we had over 45 minutes to go uh and the light came on before he lifted us out so um yeah it may, i mean just so there's so many miracles in there um listening to uh to uh pat watkins was his recollection of the uh, event um I could, they, he could not understand how it went the way it did how it you know it, it went uh how we weren't all killed uh how we didn't explode um it, it, just so many things just so so many things <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, so um, call it what you may. I call it divine intervention. Uh, I strongly believe that. Um, if, if you ask, if you ask Tilt about it, he will say divine intervention. If you ask Tim Schaff, um, it, he said that his entire life, he's, he hasn't been able to figure that out other than it had to be divine intervention. Um, so, um, yeah, believe what you may, I know what I believe. <laughs> well, and, and from being, a for somebody who wasn't there, who's reading this and hearing this, I mean, it, it sure, it sure sounds like that because it's not just one, one thing that happened. It's like, oh, well, lucky. Yeah. It was like, a, there's about a dozen different occurrences where, it just should not, things should not have happened the way that it ended yeah. up. Yeah, including the, the team that was on the ground um, and then crashing um, and still nobody, none of those guys got, got hurt at all, you know. Um, so it's, it, um, it was pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And, and again, that mission is what... Um, prompted people like uh, John Meyer and others to um, push on me, lean on me to write the story. And um, the, the title of the, the chapter, The Mission, um, on chapter 19, um, that, that name, that title came way back in 2011 when um, several of us sat around, uh, including Tilt, um, and saying that, you know, Let's let's talk about the mission. We have to get the the mission written down. You know, um, so that that's kind of how that came about. Yeah, I'm very thankful that it worked out that way. That it yeah, is me too. <laughs> and there was just one quick, uh, just one quick thing I thought was just sort of made me laugh. But even for the for the pilot who said that he had all that guilt for so many years, it sounds like a great guy because. I think you yeah. would have, even if you would have broken your legs, I think you would, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and that's what I told him. I said, you know, you saved, you saved my life. <laughs> it, it wouldn't have mattered if, if my legs got broken or not. I was going to be dead otherwise. So, you know, and and also um, another light part, lighthearted part, Crawford, um, he's, who's passed on now, but he would, whenever we would talk about um, that mission, uh, or his hearing loss, he would say, well, I, I lost my hearing because Roger was firing that damn machine gun right next to my head. <laughs> and, and I reminded him that loss of hearing is better than loss of life. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Half deaf is better than all dead. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. Even all deaf. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so from there, uh, so you, you, uh, now at the time, were you diagnosed with a uh, swollen brain, brain, uh, pardon me, spinal 
injury? Like that was at the time or you found out after that? At, that was at the, that was at the time. That's what the sur uh, the doctor that was the attending physician, um, what he deducted from it. And um, um, it wasn't written in the medical records. The, their commander um, wouldn't allow uh, specifics to be put in the medical record. He didn't, he didn't want us, he didn't want us to get a purple heart. And, uh, he was, he was exercising his, his little bit of, uh, whatever. Uh, so, um, he got his, he got his digs in at the time. I, I didn't care. I could care less. Um, but you know, uh, anyway, it, it, it came, it came about in time. <laughs> And so as, as a reader, you, you finished the, those two chapters and I assumed I'm, I figure that's the end of your time because I mean, you guys got banged up pretty bad. The helicopters destroyed, like, it sounds like, okay. And then we got healthy and went back home. Not no, so much. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> it's not over yet. <laughs> and and the the following chapter very appropriately is uh, called back in the saddle and yeah. as soon as you see that page you're, i'm like there's no way <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and and that mission itself um was quite an interesting one and the and kind of my note that i have on it kind of jumping ahead to mm -hmm. once the mission's already started um and it also relates back to what we were couple topics that we were discussing in the previous podcast um talking about being aggressive and and the, mm -hmm. the note that i have is uh, aggression equals victory and that was the, the little note that i had and and um so yeah. relaying that I'll, I'll hand it to you but talking about the the entry into the canyon to rescue uh, a team and having to basically avoid crossfire from machine right. Um, right. that team. So tell us about that mission. Yeah, um, like like so many things you do in life, if you have um, if you have a problem in the process of doing something, if you don't get back to it, I mean, if you're riding a horse and you fall off a horse, if you don't get back on, um, you're gonna live with that your whole life, that, you know, that fear um, so, so the way you deal with it is, um, I had to get back up in the air. Uh, Scott felt the same way. I mean, this is, um, it couldn't end on a sour note like that. You know, it, it, it couldn't end like that. So, um, against my, um, my, uh, first sergeant's advice and orders, <laughs> I, he, cause he pretty much grounded me verbally anyway. Um, he didn't want me flying anymore. He, you know, he just, he said that, you know, this is too much. This, you've done more than you should have more than, than required. But, but I, for myself, I had to, I had to do, you know, get in the air again and get back with SOG. I mean, that's where, not that there was an action in country because there certainly was, but um sog running sog missions um that had become my specialty and um, i needed to do that i needed to do it for my mental well-being and um so uh, back at it out of but this time the mission the first mission back was out of fob1 in fubai and um they had a team on the ground that uh, had gotten detected and so-called herded into basically a box canyon. There's no way for them to come out except through the NVA that had really blocked blocked their exit. They, the the canyon had very steep, several hundred feet uh, tall sidewalls, granite, I guess, or maybe limestone. I, I don't know. But it, it was just the sidewalls. And they got pushed up to the back of this of this canyon and needed to get out. So um, we knew what we, you know, what we had to do, but we didn't know what we're up against. Um, and, and like we always did, um, we went in to do a trolling. We went in trolling um, with the lead, our lead, our gunship and our wing ship 
uh, was behind but stayed high. Um, as we entered this canyon area um, and up above the upper level, there, there was the at the top of the canyon was almost like a plateau type situation, but it was it was covered in vegetation and whatnot. So we were up above that plateau area, heading on a downward uh, approach uh, um, angle to where the LZ was and where the team was located. As we entered the beginning area of the cannon, we started taking 12.7 um, millimeter machine gun fire from the very, very front part of the canyon on top of the canyon sidewall. And we didn't expect that. Uh, and then we were, then we were taking from the opposite side, from the right hand side, the right top wall of the canyon, the same thing. So we're, we're getting fired at and like a cross, trying to get us in a crossfire. So we, we dropped down quickly um, and then we proceeded to get our, our uh, slow approach um, to the LZ to draw fire. And we did. Uh, we, so we, we wanted to do that and we always did that to locate where our target is. And um, no better way than to do that than to, uh, you know, troll. So um, we, we did. We saw where we were taking the heavy, the fire from on the ground. And we also, as um, valuable, we saw we, we weren't taking fire. Uh, we noticed that as soon as we broke right over the over the team's location to the right side of the canyon, there was no, we weren't taking any gunfire on that side. So we knew um, that once we broke past, we would be okay. So, but we had these, these heavy machine guns to contend with. So we went back and uh, re we regrouped with our wing ship and with the slick that was going in for the team. And um, I had the bright idea um, to attack uh, head on to attack these machine guns, and from a from a distance out before they started firing. Now they had double the range um, that we had with the M60s. They 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 could shoot twice as far effectively. But I thought, you know, if I could if I could start way out, it could confuse them for a few moment, moments, maybe get them to put their heads down. So I, I mentioned it to Scott and he said, yeah, let's do that. So um, I told our, our pilot, Mr. Whitman, and he said, fine, he said, go for it. So uh, both Scott and I, from a distance out, um, we, when we started our gun run in to the, to the uh, canyon, we started firing. Now, Scott was doing to his side, what I was doing to my side. And I started firing. I knew exactly where this machine gun was located because again, it was right at the very, I couldn't physically see it, but I was able to see obviously the muzzle blast when it was, when it was firing. And um, I start, I focused on that and I, I was on the skid just firing nonstop at this, at this location. And to my surprise, um, it worked. And they didn't. They didn't open fire on us. They only opened fire on us just as we were passing. And I was, you know, kind of swinging back. They opened. They started opening fire. But at that point, we dropped down the helicopter for our approach. We were able to um, get down low. <clears throat> we got below the tops of the canyon walls, and those machine guns. They couldn't. They couldn't tip down far enough to to reach us. I mean, they're, they're made to shoot level and up in the air. Um, so it worked. That worked. <clears throat> then we focused on the um, the NVA on the ground. Um, we took a couple of hits. I felt them when uh, when we got hit, and I could also feel a little bit of vibration. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> we were able to get the team out um, successfully and um, made it back to FOB1. 
where sure enough, we had a couple holes, <clears throat> had had uh, a, a little chunk taken onto the rotor, main rotor, and had a hole in the uh, in the tail boom. Um, so yeah, that was that was back in the saddle. Now, um, on on the onset of the mission, I was feeling um, a lot of anxiety. I was it was it was really starting to um, to kick in. And um, I kept telling myself, focus, 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 do what you normally do. And what I normally would do was I would start evaluating the, the area, the topography and what was what was in around the area in case we had to do a walkout in case we you know, we got shot down. We wanted to know which way we could move, which way you couldn't move, um, where, you know, where the NVA were located. So um, as I, I started to focus on my game plan, if you will, um, it started to uh, subside. Once we got in to the action, that that's all gone. All of that was gone. Uh, when we finished and when we started to uh, head back to FOB1, then it, it started to kick in again, uh, but in, in a different way. And and I noticed it was it was different, and and I realized that it was more typical of an after action response, body response, and uh, and I thought, yeah, okay, this is good, we're okay, and and then in talking to Scott when we got back on the ground, um, he felt the same way, but we were good, we we're good to go, so. We're back. We're back in the game. Yeah, shocking. <laughs> <laughs> well, but again, you know, um, everybody had a job to do. You know, um, I always felt in my team, we, I'll speak for uh, for our, our fire team, we believed strongly to the core that um the, the people we worked with had a job to do um if they got in trouble um it was our job now to to kick in and our job we were essentially hired guns um we didn't transport food we didn't do anything else the only thing we, that we were there for is for a firefight the only thing we were trained for is to fight to have a firefight and um, so, you know, taking that approach, it was like, I mean, you couldn't do anything less. How could you do anything less? These guys did their job. All they're asking for is for us to do our job and get them out of there. And, and that's, that's the way we viewed it and, and lived by that. So, um, you know, everybody had a job to do. Well, and, and in hearing you uh, talk about the responsibility that you felt and then you combine that with when you started to feel a bit of anxiety as you're approaching and you're and the antidote uh, that you subscribe to was now it's time to focus mm -hmm. um, how valuable that is because that is you know you think about your your attention um, as a person there's only so much stuff that you can focus on at any given time mm -hmm. but all that energy it, it's it's just it's around you it's whatever you're looking at but the ability when you're feeling anxious it's kind of scattered stuff's everywhere and then the ability to focus and have very directed energy and then you combine that with the, the i guess sort of the backdrop of that is the responsibility you feel to do your job to the best of your ability and mm. then from the sounds of it that's what allowed you um basically to execute the mission and, and mm -hmm. not only to execute the mission, but deal with an unexpected occurrence with that machine gun fire. So sure. deal with the, the unknown on the fly and then also execute the mission in that way. It's it... right. And people, people's lives are depending on you, you know? So if any, I, I say, I say to people, put yourself in a position where you're trained to do a certain thing and 
now all of a sudden somebody's life depends on whether you do your job or not. And this is not a, you know, this is not a make-believe. Their life now depends on you. So are you just going to walk away from it? You know, what good are you if you don't do what you're trained to do and what you're committed to do? I mean, what what good are you? You shouldn't be doing that that kind of work. So, um, I mean, that's how we felt. We felt so connected to our our SF brothers. Um, it, 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 anything else was was not even a consideration. It never was. Never was. And and just like when you're being uh, lifted out and uh, Crawford's below you when your hand yeah. is cramped. And, yeah. and and you say, I mean, you said in this podcast and in the book very plainly, if I let go, he's we're both going. It's not just me. And how that yeah. plays on you, on your psyche. Yeah. 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 It may, I, I think it makes people do things that um, maybe they wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, I think it's a human nature, you know, for, for most of us, when you make a commitment that, that you want to, you know, abide by your commitment. Mm -hmm. Certainly so. And so after that mission, then we go to the, the <laughs> infamous POW mission. Um, oh, gosh. Yeah. And I remember, um, I, I can't remember if it was, it was in one of uh, John's books, I believe it was him, where they managed to get a POW and he ended up jumping out of the <laughs> out of the plane out of the helicopter so it didn't didn't work out so well in that instance but um no. the in the book you describe the the difficulty of those missions where just the nature of it it is just an extremely difficult mission to be successful in in that regard um let alone to have the the success uh that ended up on this mission. But one of the things that I noticed uh, or that I noted um, with this mission is that, um, so the area of operations was going to be in North Vietnam and that had its own unique dangers to you guys um, mm -hmm. as far as having some Russian firepower in, in the area. Um, yeah. And I had a question about that just before getting to the, the actual mission, but how, how much of uh, how do I phrase this? To the extent that the American population was concerned, how much did they know about Russian involvement in any way? Because I didn't know that until reading your book. No, I think I think the um, the press kept that away from the public. Um, Odd. It, <laughs> Yeah, kind of important information because kind of important information. I mean, odd, but maybe maybe not so odd the way you know the, the way the press operates. Um, you know, according to Walter Cronkite, um, uh, the the Tet Offensive was a major major victory for the North Vietnamese, which was totally backwards. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, it was it was a surprise to us when we first found out about the um about the the hind helicopters and but then it became also became a challenge somewhat of a sick perverted challenge that uh you know maybe we could get one you know maybe we could bait one uh which is really and, stupid i mean it's really stupid very competitive at all either so you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah right which, i mean it's really stupid it's like you know it's like a david and goliath scenario um but you know uh we 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 first heard the first time we heard of it was um while running missions for the with the 101st airborne and that was probably in the um in the summer uh july august time frame <clears throat> and we were called out one night uh, because there was a unidentified um helicopter larger size helicopter uh, up in the Quang Tree area, which is up near the DMZ. And um, they couldn't get a response back from the helicopter. They couldn't get it to identify them itself. And um, they wanted us to go check it out, see if we could find it. And um, as we were heading out, um, we got, uh, our pilot got talking to the, um, the uh, officer that was in charge at the 
uh, communications tower and got him to uh, to spill the beans that um, um, they, they've identified. They're certain it's a, a Russian hind helicopter up there, which is a, at that time, it was like, uh, you know, it would be like today's Apache or something. I mean, it was a fearsome, fearsome uh, gunship. So, you know, we thought, well, what the hell? Maybe, maybe we can, you know, maybe we can get this thing. So anyway, um, we, we knew that they were there. <clears throat> and we knew uh, there were um, a few teams, recon teams that had been strafed when operating up in that area, um, whether it was in the DMZ or uh, the southern part of North Vietnam, that had been strafed by these Russian helicopters. So on on this particular <laughs> on this particular mission, um, we we were well aware that they, that could come into play um and uh it didn't but um uh, the vernon ward uh having made his capture of three north vietnamese was astounding um to say the least and um when we arrived on site they were uh being pursued by a large number of, of really ticked off NPA. I mean, can you just imagine in your own backyard, uh, not one, but three of your own being snatched by this tiny group and they're, and they're getting away with it, you know, uh, the audacity, right? So uh, when we got on site, we directed, um, we di directed uh, Vernon to an LZ that uh, we picked that was fairly close. Uh, we could see him with him and his team with uh, Arthur Bader and um, and Richard Fitz um, and their, their indig, um, dragging these reluctant POWs along and trying to fend off these, these NVA that were in hot pursuit. I mean, they were under fire the whole time. They kept stopping, defending, moving. So, um, we were able to get to, to stall off the, um, the NVA and uh, allow the team to get to uh, to the pickup point. And um, there were the NVA were were um, not ready to let these guys go. I mean, they were um, they were they were facing us head on. I mean, they they were uh, you know if if nothing else. Uh, a lot of these NBA were well, well trained and well disciplined. I know I mentioned that previously. Um, aside from whatever atrocities that they they committed, um, some of them were well, well trained, and and these guys were not wanting to give up their men. Um, and that can only you know you put yourself in in their shoes, you know how it would be and how relentless you would be to uh, let them go. But anyway, um, we put enough of them down and held them back to where um, Vernon could get and his guys could get these uh, POWs loaded and extracted. Um, during the ride back, there was um, a lot of confusion going on, a lot of activity going on in the slick uh, with the POWs. And um, I mean, I could see a lot of movement. I didn't know what was going on, but you know, I could see something going on. Well, what was going on was um, one of these POWs was as hardcore as one could be. He he kept he he was wanting to jump out of the helicopter. I mean, and, and Vernon kept trying to control him, and and Vernon uh, was not a big man. I mean, he's um, you know he's a smaller in stature guy, tough, tough as nails, obviously. Um, so in his, uh, his in his uh, methods of getting this guy to quiet down, uh, he ended up Vernon ended up taking his survival knife and cracking this NVA in the back of the head and knocking him out. Finally, there was peace in the in the helicopter. When we got back, when we got back to my lock, we didn't know it at the time, but General Abrams was at my lock. 
he was with uh, Vernon Ward listening to this entire operation. Uh, he knew exactly what was going on and what had happened. And um, so when we got on the ground, um, he wanted to see this, uh, these, these POWs. Uh, two of them uh, were kept separate, um, but one, this one that was uh, so hardcore, he caught a, he apparently caught their interest to his interest as well. Um, and they were trying to interrogate him, asking him some basic questions. And Vernon was standing there next to him with his hands on him. Uh, there were a couple other a couple other SF guys there. Um, General Abrams and uh, Major Sincere. This guy uh, would not budge. He would he was just he wouldn't he wouldn't budge. He wouldn't have one of the uh, one of the SF and it may have been um, Bader or Fitz perhaps went and got the cook for Mylock. The cook at Mylock was this crazy Chinaman that uh, he was a, he was a loose cannon. It, it, the easiest way to put it, he was a wild man. And they must have put him up to a little act, uh, do a little performance, because he come running out uh, from the mess area up to where we were carrying a large meat cleaver, screaming and hollering. And they, they you know, they fakely grabbed him as he got really close to this NBA and he's yelling and yelling and yelling at him. And apparently what he was, he was yelling in, in uh, Vietnamese. I didn't know what he was saying, but apparently he was telling him that he wanted to kill him because the, the NBA wiped out his entire family and, you know, so on and so forth. And anyway, they moved him out of the picture and this guy is standing there, this NBA is standing there, and all of a sudden he's starting to starting to wobble a little bit. And um, all of a sudden he just dropped. He dropped like a rock. Uh, Vernon Ward, Lieutenant Ward, uh, told me he thought he killed him. He said he thought he died right in front of General Abrams. <laughs> what had happened? Apparently he had a concussion, you know, um, he they got him to in a, a few moments and then shipped him down to uh, to Saigon for further interrogation. But this guy was hard, hard, hardcore. Nothing faced him. But uh, poor Vernon, he he thought he had he had thought he had killed this this valuable asset. Um, and at, at that time, uh, General Abrams said that um, that this action. Um, uh, warranted Silver Star. Uh, Vernon did get the Silver Star for this. Um, Art Bader and uh, Richard Fitz didn't. Um, and that's been a bone of contention over the years by uh, by the family, and, and rightfully so. Now, I, I, I being a witness uh, myself, I couldn't say for sure that the general said, Vernon, you, you know, are going to get a silver star or just said that this deserves a silver star, meaning the team. I don't know, but uh, Vernon was the only one that ended up getting that uh, for some reason. But that was a uh, that was pretty remarkable uh, mission, pretty amazing mission. And it is such a comedic scene too, to the oh. the way it's described. And, and of course, it had to be in front of General. Even I have heard of General Abrams, and I'm a Canadian. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was not good. It was not good. It was like, uh oh. <laughs> and and he, I, did, he did look like. I mean, he did look like he died. I mean, he just <laughs> he went down so hard. <laughs> And and I'm sure uh, uh, Ward was uh, teased mercilessly for that for years to come. I'm sure. That's oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, his moment in the sun. <laughs> and so uh, we're kind of we're still doing okay on time. We're getting near the end here, but um, yep. this last chapter, as far as the the last mission um, that you end up, or the last mission that's recorded. Um, in the book here and what's you know the thing that i always forget too is the the pacing 
of the missions that you were going like the the this is even from when you got crashed rescued days later back out you know yeah. this isn't this isn't oh a month or weeks like you you forget that but the the pacing uh, of the book and and as far as the memoir is concerned it's ridiculous um, yeah. very hard to believe um but then coming to uh this this final mission and just kind of jumping a ahead a little bit um but this mission was extremely chaotic as well um especially for the team on the ground and um as well as for you guys in the air uh, dealing with um you know the what was now the typical um you know triple a fire very yeah, another day <laughs> another day in soccer <laughs> that's right um but what was so one of the things that was so interesting um on this mission is the the so you're communicating between covey and the team on the ground and you guys in the air and then you just there's no more contact with the team on the ground um, right. in a way and i guess what was happening was that the NVA were so close to the team on the ground that they couldn't speak into the radio to communicate, but they were, and I guess by keying the radio, I guess they were just like activating it to. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's keying the squelch. So on the, on the receiving end, you just get. Shh, shh, shh. So, you know, somebody's there that there's somebody alive and they're there. Yeah. And at this point they're hunkered in, in a, uh, crater, a bomb yes. crater, right. um, basic and and seriously from the from the sounds of it, they're like at this point, and then once you guys reach in and start your gun runs, you you are basically saying this is going to be danger close, you know, understatement of the year where bullets are from from the M60 and and as you describe it, the once you locate the team, you locate the enemies, and you're you make a comment that the pilot. If he makes a, a move, if he doesn't hold the, the plane steady, uh, the helicopter steady, it's going to be a friendly fire situation because that is how close the enemies were to the squad on the ground. Right. Ridiculous. Um, so you end up um, successful in, the, in that regard. The team gets out. Uh, ridiculous fighting um, as far as uh, on the extraction. Um and then what was interesting as well, um, kind of near the end of the chapter, um, once the adrenaline kind of comes down, um, it's the first time in the book, really, other than when you mentioned that the, the, sort of that adrenaline and a bit of that anxiety from your first mission um, heading into that canyon, describe it a little bit there, but overall, you're good to go, just like a... Yeah reasonable level of anxiety is to be expected you know before yeah. and after a mission um but then at the end of this one there's a bit of a bit of a change in in the tone and i just like the way it was written so i just want to read this uh, brief uh, paragraph here uh during our flight back to my lock as the adrenaline receded and the fatigue started to settle in i began thinking about how little time i had left in country and that i should soon be receiving my orders to return to the states I also started thinking that maybe I should stop making trips across the fence with Sod. I had been very lucky so far and these missions were extremely dangerous. Maybe it was time to be very selective in choosing my flights. Maybe this should be my last mission across the fence. I so very much enjoyed working with these incredible warriors from Mylock and FOB1 and I had mixed feelings about ending my time with them. And yeah, and so it's it, it was interesting just to read that like, almost like the the clock just kind of ticked and and it was but then also that mixed feeling where you you have these you not only feel this responsibility but you like these guys you like the yeah. work there's mm -hmm. these bonds that have been formed and and that sort of lends itself to um when you are then um sent home in the following chapter and there's a, a portion i want to cover at the end of that um but just you know just describe what how were you feeling at that point? Yeah, that was um, that was tough. It was really tough. It was it, mixed mixed emotions, mixed feelings. Um, the combat had, um, and I, I've spoken to others. I've spoken to people like Tilt and other recon guys about combat. 
um, combat can become somewhat like a drug, if you will. Um, and it's maybe it's because of the adrenaline rushes that you get, but it, it almost becomes something that you ha you have to do. You need to do. You need to get back out there. Um, so I was facing a situation where I was only, um, you know, a matter of days away from returning to the U.S. I had so many, so many close calls. Um, I'd been told by so many people, what are you doing? You, you got to stop. Um, and then I started questioning, I was questioning my own sanity as far as, you know, what are you trying to do? Or, you know, do you have a death wish here? Is that what's going on? Which, which I thought, no, that that's definitely not it, but you can't help but think some of these things because you don't, you don't want to quit. Um, you've made good friendships. You know that you've saved people's lives. Um, and what's going to happen? Are, are, are the people replacing you? Are they going to? Are they going to do their job as well as you did? Are they going to be able to protect these guys? Um, or are they going to turn and run and leave them? Then, you know, you have my family and coming back to the world and my fiance, uh, who, who was going to be my fiance. I mean, um, you know, so it was a lot of a lot of real mixed emotions. And um, it was it was abrupt for me. It was it was really hard. That last mission, um, that was also Vernon Ward. Uh, that, He's that, a troublemaker. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a troublemaker, um, but he appreciated the uh, the the work. He told he told me um, that he had never been shot so close to by friendly fire than he was on that day. <laughs> he said he could not believe, um, and and he said it was you know those M sixty rounds were coming within fifteen feet of him um so and that's that's where i i, I mentioned how it, it's a lot of pilot skill too because if 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 our pilot flinched those rounds would have come right down on on vernon uh, but he didn't and i knew he wouldn't you know so that that's the confidence so it was it was really hard it was really really hard um i didn't have a uh, a definite return date at that point but we were already into november and I was supposed to come home in November. So yeah, that was that was a tough one. That was a tough one. Um, so there were no no ceremonies, no, you know, because I, I didn't I don't know. I, I didn't I didn't have uh, I guess what it takes to tell them that I was giving up. I wasn't gonna come back. Um I didn't want to face that. So I didn't say anything. I just uh you know, that was it. Mm -hmm. And so then it, it discusses, the, the book discusses, and um, you have qu quite an interesting journey um, back home, and, and even mm -hmm. uh, at Fort Dix, you end up in the same barracks on your first day and last day, which... Yeah, just bizarre. Yeah. Just bizarre. Go figure, right? <laughs> Add it to the list. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was, it was strange. It was bizarre. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, on the last, I guess this is actually the last two pages of um, the book, technically, and then there's the epilogue. Um, but there's uh, just a, a few paragraphs here that I, I want to read because the the way that you wrote this, it's a very, um, it's for veterans today, it's just, a, it fits perfectly well. Um, and considering that you know, it's just interesting when you think about the military and, and how they're treated and how they're treated well, how that's changed, how sometimes that's mm -hmm. not the case. But the fact that you're in combat one day, you're sent home the next, and you're expected to just be, well, you're, you're a civilian now. Have fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how that really hasn't seemed to have changed much. But anyway, I'll read this portion of the book here. 
In the army's infinite wisdom, they took men like me right from combat where we were literally fighting for our lives on a daily basis and overnight turned us loose and expected us to be normal civilians. There was no decompression time for us. The military bureaucrats never considered the emotional effects combat had on us. They never considered, or maybe they never even cared about, how life was going to be for those that had experienced combat. No preparation, no support, nothing at all. At around 8 a.m. Saturday morning on November 30th, 1968, I was officially released from the Army. I was waiting outside on that cold winter morning for my family to drive the 150 miles from Bridgeport, Connecticut to Fort Dix, New Jersey. My mind was starting to wander. I was standing in my dress greens with, without an overcoat to keep me warm. Even though I was in uniform, I was no longer in the active Army. I was also aware that I was not really a civilian either. For the past three years, I had been either intensely training for fighting for my life in South Vietnam or fighting in a top secret war across the fence in Laos and North Vietnam. Now I was neither soldier nor civilian and my head was swirling. I wasn't sure what I was. I felt like a man left in limbo and all alone for the first time in the last three years. I could almost feel my dagger strapped to my leg, but it was gone forever. I no longer had my Smith & Wesson Victory Naval, Victory Navy Model 38 caliber revolver on my hip, and I no longer had my M16 or my M60. I felt extremely vulnerable and depression was setting in. How was I going to adjust to this new life as a civilian? A year ago, when I left Fort Campbell to go to Vietnam, I felt young and excited. Now I felt so much older than I did then. I also felt very confused. I was so cold and I felt so misplaced in this world. Half of my combat experiences must be hidden from everyone for the next 20 years. How was I going to deal with the fact that I could not discuss those missions with anyone? I would be in my 40s by the time anyone would know what I had done, the tremendous risks that I had taken, and the incredible men from SOG that I had been so privileged to go across the fence with. How would I explain the events that took place on September 28, 1968? I could see the anniversary gold-colored 62 Impala SS coming down the street driven by my brother-in-law. My sister was in the passenger seat and my parents were in the back seat. I needed to quickly pull myself together, shake off the depression and fear of the unknown. They were expecting to see a proud, decorated and strong warrior who had been brought safely home from combat. It was time for me to put brutality, hardship and the stress of combat behind me. Stand straight, smile, and greet my family. After all, somehow I had survived the last 12 months. It's over. At least that's what I thought at the time. That's intense. Mm. It was very intense. I mean, I can, you know, I can feel it at a certain level now. I mean, it's, that was um, probably the darkest day of my life um, at, at those moments. I mean, it just... It was very, very bad. I thought I was I, there for a few moments. I thought I was losing my mind. Uh, it just, it just was uh, too much, too much, too quickly. You know, uh, no decompression. Because at this time, so, so you're Fort Dix, just heading back home to Connecticut, and it was the, the traveling was less than it was like thirty six hours from 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 the time i left fort camp i mean since I, from the time i left vietnam yeah 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 it was um <laughs> yeah it was less than 36 hours yeah it's ridiculous yeah 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 <laughs> totally totally see now one thing you know, i mean there is a you have to have a little bit of a caveat or exp explanation here i still had um less than 4 months on my enlistment now, had I served out those three plus months, almost four months, maybe um, there would have been decompression time. But in again, in the in their infinite wisdom, they uh, the military perhaps thought they were doing me a favor by giving me an early release. But with that early release was no decompression, none whatsoever, going from again, going from combat to uh, supposedly being a civilian and 36 hours or less, um, it, it just it just doesn't work. It does not work, you know. 
uh, like I said in the book, I'm, I'm standing there in uniform, a paratrooper, a combat vet, but I'm not a soldier. You know, not anymore. I'm, I'm supposed to be a civilian. Maybe I would have been more comfortable standing there in civilian clothes. I don't know. I really don't know, but um, but it was a bad time. It was it was a tough time, and I had to I had to really stuff it deep because um, my my family was so happy that I had survived, and they didn't know anything about you know what I did, you know. Um, so yeah, it was it was a, it was a tough time. That was tough. And and even just the the dissonance between. Because obviously you're happy to see your family. Of course you are. Yeah, but of course. You, there's that that split where it's like, okay, we gotta, yeah, I gotta, I gotta put this away, and I gotta be, I gotta be happy for these people who are just elated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was, it was rough, and 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 when I I say I, I felt so uh, alone, I mean I felt like I'm. A man without a country, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I was um, I was on guard twenty four hours a day, on alert, um, a high tension twenty four hours a day. I never had any time off. I mean, my I was on call twenty four seven, um, ex- with the exception of when I went to R and R for five seven days. Now, all of that is just you know go from that to supposedly a, a civilian i don't even know how to act like a civilian <laughs> you know but i'm not a soldier you know so yeah that was a t- that was a t- that was a tough time that was that was a tough time and then at that point in the book it, it lends itself to then the the epilogue and the epilogue essentially covers basically 1968 to the publication of the book so it's a very large mm. chunk of time um, yeah. But you end up, you get married, you have your your children, and then later on, you end up having grandchildren as well. Um, get a get a job, you you, you know, it's <laughs> it's okay. I gotta go do the civilian civilian thing now. Um, <laughs> but what I I want to jump ahead a bit just um, because of time's sake. Uh, but just because the <laughs> when you receive your purple heart, it made me laugh as well. It just kind of was like just you sh- yeah. <laughs> It's just so typical. <laughs> just so typical. <laughs> yeah. So tell us, tell us about that one. Yeah, t- uh, two thousand and one, um, the year that um, that Sag was made public. It was the year that it was finally declassified, and the, the Department of Defense admitted that we existed and that we did what we did. Um, so, Fourth of July, two thousand and one. I um, go to the mailbox. It was on a Saturday. Went to the mailbox, and um, in the in the mailbox is uh, this large Manila envelope that's partially torn open on the bottom. And I thought, what the heck is this? And then I see Department of the Army stamp on it, and I thought, th- what the heck? So I went in the back. My wife and I were sitting out on our deck and I opened the thing and there's no letter. (laughs) There's just a, this document and, uh, you know, it's, there's this document and a box a metal box, a, me- a metal award box, blue box. And I open it up and here's my purple heart. <laughs> Out of, you know, um, unannounced, uneventful. Um, and after talking to people um, at SOG, again, years later in 2011 timeframe, they, they said that Apparently, when the when all the records were opened, they realized that um, you know something had happened here and put two to two together somehow, and uh, decided you should have your medal. 
So that was again so typical. It was it was as typical as just dumping me loose with no decompression. It just under, and you know what? If the if the box if the uh, envelope was torn anymore, the metal would have been lost. It would have been gone forever, and uh, that that wouldn't have that wouldn't have surprised me either. <laughs> that would have been the icing on the cake. But um, yeah, that that's how that uh, that finally came about. And then 2011, yeah, uh, you get a, a interesting phone call. I did. It, it was a Sunday night. It was about 10 o'clock at night. My wife and I had just gone to bed, and the phone rings. I answer the phone, and on the other end, uh, someone is asking, "Is this Roger Lockshire who served with the 101st Airborne?" And I said, "Yes." And red flags are going are going up all over the place, you know. And he said, uh, "You served with um, B Company, Black Angels, gunships." Now, nobody knows about nobody in in military, you know, arenas. They even know of the Black Angels. We existed for only about seven months, and um, so then. Um, I thought this, you know, this is interesting and my mind is racing. I said, who am I talking to? <clears throat> and he said, hey, chief, this is Scott, Scott the Armin. And I, I couldn't believe it. I hadn't spoken to Scott since I left Vietnam. Um, and so we started talking. He said, hey, there's some guys looking for us, some guys from special forces looking for us. And I said, well, you know, what's that all about? And he went on to say, it's about it's it, evolved, it, it goes around the mission of September 28th. Um, he said they've been trying to reach us um, and reconnect with us. And um, they're saying that there are some awards that they owe us that should have been awarded back in the day that somehow didn't for whatever reason. So that's opened up. Uh, that started a whole new thing. He said, um, "He said, uh, can I give your phone number to, turns out, Richard Crawford? And I said, my God. I mean, I knew Dick from, from back then. And I said, yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, a few days later, Crawford calls me in his gruff manner. I mean, he, he hadn't changed a bit. Gruff, gruff. You would either love him or love to hate him, you know. And that could happen the same day. Um, so we got to talking and he told me what was going on and he said, um, I need, I, <laughs> I need you to send me your social security number. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> There's no way. And he said, no, nah, no, it's okay. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> I said, no, there's no way. I'm not going to do that. And he said, but I have to have it. And uh, so as we talked it through, um, he, I told him, you know, you got to send me some documentation. You got to send me stuff. So anyway, he, he sent me, he sent me all the papers from um, Senator Bill Nelson's office. Senator Bill Nelson at the time was the Senator of Florida. And um, sure enough, it was, it was all legit. Uh, and, and I was able to, I had to supply my social security number and, um, to the, to the center's office and, and whatnot, uh, long and short of it, we were, Scott and I were, um, and, and Richard Chapman, he was the co-pilot. Um, Jim Whitman had passed away. He had passed away around 2008 in a private plane crash, his own plane, um, we had been invited to a uh, Special Operations Association reunion in Las Vegas uh, and invited to join the association, the organization. Um, went down there, met up with all these guys that I hadn't seen for 43 years. Um, some of them I didn't recognize by face, but then when we started talking, everything clicked. Um, and during that visit, among other things, um, I was awarded a uh, Distinguished Flying Cross and a Bronze Star uh, for my work at Mylock. 
um, and, and the uh, Flying Cross was for the September 28th uh, uh, mission. So uh, that, that opened up, that reconnection opened up a whole world to me. Um, now, after 40 plus years, I had validation to what I had done. Nobody, nobody but nobody knew uh, what I had done other than served with the, with the 101st and did some, some missions with special forces. Uh, because a after 20 years, um, I couldn't come out and say, hey, by the way, you know, to people that I had known all those years, it would be like, what, what is he in, in drugs, on drugs, or is he daydreaming or what? I mean, who could possibly believe that, you know? Because um, I didn't have anybody who could back me up. There was no one in my life that could back me up. So now all of a sudden, everything came together. It was a, a part of my life and a part of my body that my, my heart that was filled that had been empty for so long and um, reconnected with all these people. I found out that a, that a guy that uh, we had worked with um, by the name of Eldon Bargewell, he was now a major general. <laughs> he, was, he was an E4 when I was an E5. He was a corporal when I was a sergeant. <laughs> and, uh, and he has stayed in the military with, uh, he was part of Delta. Uh, he was part of uh, Special Operations Command um, his whole career, uh, met up with, with Tilt, which um, I didn't know in Vietnam, but I ran missions out of FOB1 while he was at FOB1. He came in in May of FOB, uh, at FOB1. By that time, uh, a little after May, June, July timeframe, I was really doing most of my missions out of my lock, um, but still ran some out of uh, FOB1 and um, just reconnected with so many other guys that I knew from back back then, including Crawford, who was hooked to my to my side. Um, uh, so, yeah, 2011 was a major milestone. And then from there, um, as I mentioned before, people from SOAR, from Special Operations Association, rather, um, were encouragement, encouraging me to write a book. Um, many of them told me that, you know, Roger, um, we were going out, you know, once every couple of weeks, you know, uh, maybe once every three weeks. You were going out there every day. Um, you've got a story. It's different, you know. You, it's a different story. You got, you've got to do it. So, um, you know, I had always wanted to write down my experiences so that my sons and my grandchildren would know, but I didn't think of writing it into a book. I wanted, I wanted them to know. So when I started writing the book, um, it was with them in mind. I wanted to write a book that if it was rated like a, like a movie rating, that it might be rated PG um, at most. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, keeping them in mind, I wanted them to be able to read it without being offended. I wanted people, went, men, women, anybody to read it and not be offended by either the language or the gore or the, you know, you know the, the way things really were, but didn't need, I felt didn't need to be described in detail. Um, so that that's how the whole thing came about and the book came together. And as I met people, at sort of like Vernon Ward um, and, uh, and and Tim Schaff and a, a whole host of others, these stories reconnected because I had, um, I, for example, Vernon Ward, um, he was, he was telling, started telling me about how he was left out there in Laos and he had to use his mirror, his signal mirror to, um, to show his location. I said, well, geez, that was, and then I went in and told him how the mission rolled out. And he said, yeah, that was the same one. And then, so I could connect the name with the occurrence. And, and that's how uh, several parts of the book came together by connecting. Uh, I kept a diary, um, a journal, and it was loose, loosely, because I couldn't put too much detail into it because of security. Um, but I did list certain things and certain things and occasionally mention a name here or a name there. 
and then it put everything kind of fell together. Uh, so that that's how the book all came about. Well, and, and the book is incredible. Um, and there's a link to it uh, on the episode description. It's listed on the, the reading list on the Mysteria podcast website. And I'll hold it up again for everybody to check it out. We Saved Sog Souls. And uh, just, you know, just in, in, in my experience as um, just sitting on, on this end of the screen and, and being able to speak with you. And, and if you're listening to this right now, um, both of these episodes are, they've been released on the same day. Um, so you're, you're listening to them consecutively here. Um, but we recorded these uh, yesterday and then today. And I know when I record just like, I don't know how I describe it, a regular podcast, a less intense mm -hmm. podcast, they're tiring. They, you know, they're, it's, it's effort to sit down and record these and, and, to um, sit down and do two of these back to back where even for me, they're draining. And I'm very appreciative of, of taking your time as well to sit down. And, you know, we're talking about the, some experiences in your life that were the, the highest of highs and the absolute lowest of lows. And I'm so grateful and appreciative to speak with you and, and to hear your perspective on, on the events that occurred. And thank you so much for writing this book. It's extremely powerful. And, you know, again, to think, you know, how our paths have crossed uh, to this point. Um, right. It's very interesting to me and, and so grateful to share this. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and, and working with you on this podcast. It's been it's been really good. It's been really good. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, sir. And uh, I as with John, I hope to meet you in person at some point as well. I hope. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I hope our paths do pat do cross again in person. Yes, sir. And thank you so much for that. So go uh, go buy this book and the audio book as well. And and actually, just a, a quick little comment. Um, so I, I ended up listening to a, a brief bit of the audio book. I am going to listen to the whole thing, but I just ended up reading the the whole book mm -hmm. instead. Just based on time between getting it and recording these episodes. Um, but it was quite funny because you, you made a comment to me um, saying how um, the, the actor, I suppose, who reads the book for you, um, you auditioned a bunch and you wanted one who sounded like a younger version of you. That actually is true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a bit of a laugh about that. I'm like, oh, that actually is that what I figured, yeah. Good, <laughs> good. <laughs> then I succeeded in what I set out to do. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. But uh, yeah, I just had to throw that out there. But um, thank you. That'll be a wrap for today. And uh, thank you again, Roger. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. It's been a real pleasure, Marcus. Very well. Thank you.